Thank you all for coming down here tonight. We appreciate the invitation to speak. We had a lovely drive here. It's beautiful. And being in Burlington all the time, we don't always get through the Vermont Hills. So we're here to talk about three things. Fukushima Daiichi and what's happened there. Vermont Yankee and what some of the expectations may be for all of you with the decommissioning planned in beginning in uh, shutdown in 2014. And uh, a little bit of our personal history we were asked to speak about and about Fairwinds Energy Education. Yeah, I wanted to start today with a, a, a brief discussion of um, uh, sort of how we got into this situation and, and, and why we're all here to begin with. Um, and then Maggie and I will, will go to a PowerPoint, and after that PowerPoint, there'll be uh, time to answer questions. Um, think about it. We, this meeting would not be necessary if policymakers in the United States uh, and at the NRC really believed what they saw on television, uh, if they really believed that the Fukushima Daiichi accident happened, we wouldn't be having this meeting tonight because they would know, like we know, that accidents can happen, accidents do happen, and that accidents are inevitable. Um, and um, given that and the great consequences of a nuclear accident, um, I, I think policymakers uh, are, are fooling themselves if they believe that it can't happen here. I have a saying, sooner or later in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. And, and I think that, that, you know, that, that proved itself repeatedly. Yeah, Yankee and uh, all the plants in the United States are, have an interesting uh, dichotomy. The, um, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will tell you the chance of a meltdown is one in a million. And um, uh, they use a thing called probabilistic risk assessment, PRA. And I like to call it prey because th th that's really how the numbers developed, I think. Uh, to, to, to claim that it's a one in a million probability. So if you take a million and divide it by 400 nuclear plants, that means that the chance of one meltdown is something like every 2,500 uh, 2, years. So from the time the Parthenon was built until now, um, there should have been just one nuclear meltdown. So that's what the NRC's PRA tells us. But, but in fact, the, um, the, the real world tells us something different. There's been five meltdowns in, in my professional career, um, uh, starting with Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, and, and three at Fukushima. So if you use those numbers, 35 in the numerator and seven in the denominator, a five in the denominator, you wind up with about an accident every seven years. So let's round it off to once a decade. And policymakers are blinded by the PRA when in fact the, the data that the, the world gives them uh, is in fact a lot more reliable. I recently, I recently gave a um, gave a speech uh, at at, um, at Pickering Plant up in Canada, and the um, uh, the Canadians do things a little bit differently there. You actually get to present directly to the commission, but all the people before me said that um, Pickering should be allowed to continue for another five years. It was up against the end of its useful life. And they didn't want to fix it, they just wanted to run it five more years. And the logic was something like, you know, we've got, um, we've got nice people who work at this plant, and uh, they're in the church choir, and uh, they're coaching our kids in Little League or in soccer, and they pay lots of taxes, and they're a good corporate citizen. And by, by that logic, you know, good people will know if their plant is not safe or not. Well, I got to know the nuclear reactor operators at, at Three Mile Island. After the accident, I had people on my staff working at Three Mile Island, so I got to know Three Mile Island people. And I can assure you, they were incredibly conscientious people, pillars of their community, and very safety conscious. And yet, an accident happened. After, after Chernobyl, I got to know some of the operators that, that, that were there. And um, th there's nobody who's a better engineer than the, than the Russian engineers. They, they are phenomenal engineers. 
totally committed to safety. Their families lived within sight of the nuclear reactor. Nice people. And yet, an accident happened. And I also, Maggie and I wrote a book that's only in Japanese, but uh, it was a bestseller in Japan. Um, and after we wrote the book, uh, we got to know a lot of uh, the people who worked at Fukushima Daiichi. And it's the same thing. You know, they lived a couple miles away. Um, the, the Japanese are meticulous, and yet an accident happened. And I think the lesson here is not that, um, that you know, just because these people are nice, that, the, um, uh, that an accident won't happen. An accident can happen despite good people working at the plant. And um, so whenever I hear um, uh, people say that, I, I, I pinch myself and I say, a nuclear plant can have 40 good years and, and just one bad day. That reminds me a little bit of, of Lake Wobegon with Garrison Keillor where um, all, the, all the women are strong, all the men are um, handsome, and all the, all the children are smarter than average. The, um, if, as I go around the country, I bump into uh, uh, you know, lots of towns that have a nuclear plant. And the plant is, um, um, everybody in town thinks their plant is better than average. So um, I, I, I probably should write to Garrison Keillor and get him to use that in his, uh, in his analogy. The Lake Wobegon reactor probably is better than, than average as well. But the take out here is that this is a technology that can have 40 great years to be wiped out by one bad day. And it's happened five times in 35 years. So it's not uh, infrequent, and God knows it's not inconsequential. Um, Mikhail Gorbachev has said that the uh, accident at, um, at Chernobyl is the cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Not perestroika, it's the accident at Chernobyl. And you know, if you look at the, what's going on in, in Japan now, um, I just spoke with Prime Minister Khan last week to, to he and I and several others. And Prime Minister Khan was the guy who was running Japan at the time of the accident. And, and he was pro-nuclear before the accident. He said, we should never start these plants back up again because the risk is too great. 40 good years and one bad day. Well, what does it mean if, um, uh, when, when a company like Entergy says that Vermont Yankee is safe, um, what, what exactly does that mean? Um, that means that the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in congressional hearings has admitted that they only look at less than 5% of the paperwork in the plant. And so what safe means is that an inspector has checked boxes off showing that, that um, the data is available. Um, but the other pieces of that that Entergy doesn't, doesn't share with you is that these um, commissioners, the NRC commissioners, are uh, appointed by Congress but they are vetted by the nuclear industry before they get their appointment. So every one of these commissioners is, um, uh, is in a position where um, to get the commission, he needs the approval of the industry which he is supposed to be um, overseeing. So what exactly does it mean to be safe? Um, it means that uh, that same lobbying group called NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute, works with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff to develop the laws that these plants work under. So laws that were written by lobbyists that work for the nuclear industry and approved by commissioners who are vetted by the nuclear industry um, are then used as a cover for a company like Entergy to claim that they're safe. There are only two commissioners and, and now a third who finished their terms and did not go back to work for the nuclear industry. One is Peter Bradford from Vermont. Uh, he lives in Peru, Vermont, and he went to work uh, as head of the utility regulation board for New York State. Um, he was a commissioner during Three Mile Island. The other is Victor Galinsky, and he's in California now, correct? Yeah, yeah. And he also did not, and now current Chairman Yasko, who was forced, he was the last chair. There's uh, Allison McFarland is now the chair. But Chairman Yasko was drummed out last year by the nuclear industry. 
And, uh, of course, because he wouldn't capitulate, and he was trying to uphold the law that they've been chartered to do, which is protect public health and safety first. So that's when you hear Entergy say, well, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has approved it. Um, that was based on commissioners that they had um, individually uh, approved. So the, let, let's talk a little bit about some of these corporations that run nuclear power plants. And I'll talk about Entergy because it's in our backyard, but um, it's applicable to all of them. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allowed all of these power plants to be spun off as something called limited liability corporations. It's an LLC. And um, so Entergy owns uh, a dozen nuclear power plants, each of which is an individual LLC. Vermont Yankee is an LLC. Um, uh, on, the, on the Hudson, we've got Indian Point 2 is a separate LLC from Indian Point 3. Well, what does that mean? It means that if um, Vermont Yankee can't pay its decommissioning bill, um, the LLC can declare bankruptcy and the corporation is shielded. If there's an accident at Indian Point 2 that releases radiation, the Indian Point 2 can declare bankruptcy and Indian Point 3 can continue to generate profits that go to Entergy that, and it's not responsible for paying the cleanup caused by the other unit. So this LLC structure is a, is a, a way to avoid liabilities, hence the name, Limited Liability Corporation. Now, Entergy wouldn't do that, would they? They did. In, after Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, Entergy had the distribution company that ran the power in New Orleans. And um, uh, they declared bankruptcy. They left the city of New Orleans high and dry. And they used their LLC structure to do just that. Um, what that then caused was a, a government bailout of Entergy's LLC. And they actually took community development block grants that were uh, aimed at millions of dollars in community development block grants that were aimed to help the poor people of New Orleans. And they gave that money to Entergy instead to dig itself out of bankruptcy. And Entergy gave its, bon its executives bonuses. So that's problem one with the corporate structure. Now, on Entergy, we discovered when I was on the oversight panel that Entergy was not putting enough money into the plant. I, I don't think we're, any of us are surprised there. But part of the problem with, that, the, with the leak that we had a couple years ago was that they hadn't put enough money into the plant and uh, they were basically riding it into the ground. What the panel said uh, was, um, I've got the words right here, um, limited resource allocation for non-safety systems might therefore be systemic within Entergy. That's what five people unanimously said, including uh, three who were definitely uh, uh, pro-nuclear. So the conclusion of our panel was that Entergy as a corporation is not spending enough on their power plants. Um, now, Entergy brought in another panel at Indian Point of their own people. This wasn't appointed by by Peter Shumlin for my case and, and others, but they brought in 12 experts of their own people. And, and on Indian Point, they came to the same conclusion. Here's what they said. Um, the physical condition of the plant is visibly deficient. The care and maintenance of some other plant systems and structures do not meet the standards of high performing plants. And then they talk about resource allocation again. Now, what was Ener Entergy's response to that? They cut the staff at Vermont Yankee by 5%. So when two panels are telling them they're not spending enough money, their solution is to cut even further. What did the NRC do? Nothing. Um, the quote from the NRC, uh, a guy named Neil Sheehan, who's the uh, public relations spokesman for the NRC said, um, quote, the NRC has the ability to determine whether there are any adverse impacts through our reactor oversight process. If we observe any negative trends via inspection findings or performance indicators, we could determine if there is any linkage to human resource changes. Well, what that says to me 
is that when the plant breaks down and the nuclear core is sitting in the middle of Main Street, they may come in and make the determination that they, they cut too much of their staff. And you may remember, Neil Sheehan, from the pictures you saw of the cooling tower with all the water flowing out when Vermont Yankees cooling towers collapsed. Now, they had, it had been recommended for years that they fix things with the cooling towers and take care of them, and, and they chose not to. Neil Sheehan's quote at that time, until a whistleblower got the pictures out, was, oh, nothing wrong here, just a slight deformity in the wood. And that's what he told Vermont's governor, Vermont's legislators, and that was his comment until that night um, we received a picture from a whistleblower and passed it on and, and someone blogged it. And, you know, you just cannot believe what the NRCPR team is, is trying to tell you. R related to that, on this issue of staff reductions, it's not just energy. Um, the, the Millstone plant, which is down in Connecticut on Long Island Sound, um, uh, reduced its staff. And the people that owned its comment was, well, we're reducing it to come down to the industry average. And the NRC approved it. Now, now think about that. If here's the industry average, and you're over the average going down, that's acceptable. But that would imply that there's people under the average that should go up. And that doesn't happen. It's a downward ratchet that the NRC always approves. So um, it, it, it again speaks to this oversight issue and, and corporations are really uh, running the show at, um, at Entergy, I mean at the NRC, I'm sorry. Now there's a, a couple things getting into Vermont Yankee specifically. Uh, we, get, we get emails all the time about the accident at Fukushima and is it like a plant in our country? Um, and let's look at Vermont Yankee. Uh, Vermont Yankee is identical to Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, all three units are, I, uh, two of the three units are identical to Fukushima Daiichi. And one of them had just gotten approval to run beyond its 40th year, just like Vermont Yankee got approval to run beyond its 40th year. So we're dealing with the identical technology that we've seen blow up three times at Fukushima Daiichi. Um, and this was known for years. Maggie and I were walking literally six weeks before the accident. This is in February through our neighborhood. And, and Maggie said, you know, we do a lot of expert reports. Um, where do you think the next nuclear accident will be? And I said, I don't know where it's going to be, but I know it's going to be in a general, react general electric boiling water reactor with the Mark I containment. And that was exactly what Fukushima Daiichi was. Three days after the accident, the NRC was recording a phone call between their executives. And one of their executives blow, blurted out, this is the worst containment in the world. Now, he didn't come to that conclusion three days after the accident. It's been known for 20 years. And we've got one here in Vermont. And thankfully, hopefully, it will hold together for one more year before it shut down. But there's 23 others just like it in the United States that continue to run. So with the NRC senior guy says, this is the worst containment in the world. And yet in America, we let 23 of them continue to run. Worse than that is the spent fuel pool. And we'll talk about that in the slides. The spent fuel pool has, um, um, for my Yankee, it's a big box is the reactor building. At the top of that box is where the nuclear fuel is stored. At Fukushima Daiichi, they stored seven years worth of nuclear fuel there. Vermont Yankees got close to 40. The fuel in that pool contains more cesium than all of the atomic bombs that were ever fired in above ground testing. 700 bombs worth of cesium is in that pool on the top of Vermont Yankee. And why does cesium matter? I mean, why is that a radioactive isotope that's important? Because it's a muscle seeker. You eat bananas, you get potassium in your body, Cesium is absorbed into your body just as potassium is. Uh, in Chernobyl, since the accident in Chernobyl, they've had a thing with youth called Chernobyl heart because the heart absorbs so much cesium, it malfunctions or grows abnormally. 
all different organs can be impacted by the cesium that is absorbed into the body. The nuclear people will like to say, well, cesium is just like potassium. And chemically it is. They're right above each other and right below each other in the periodic table. But the, the energy that's released when a cesium atom disintegrates is a million times more powerful than the energy when a, when a, a, a potassium ion um, uh, uh, is ejected. So um, the, the comparison is false, but you might, you might hear about the banana equivalent doses. And it's, it's, uh, it's designed to obscure the facts. Well, the other thing is um, uh, the, the last piece of this, and we don't think of it much in New England, but it's earthquake frequency. Um, you know, that, that seems to be a West Coast problem. Well, in fact, East Coast plants are more dangerous from the standpoint of earthquake damage than the West Coast plants. Um, the West Coast plants were built to withstand earthquakes, but the East Coast plants were not. Um, do you remember the earthquake we had like two years ago down, uh, it was in Virginia, and it was about 10 miles away from the North Anna nuclear plant. The, um, the, the ground moved about six inches, just literally the earth moved six inches sideways. And uh, it was a Richter six. And the nuclear industry's position was, isn't this great, the plant withstood a Richter 6. Well, the plant's maximum design basis was a Richter 6. I would hope it met what it was designed, but what the industry doesn't tell you is that they thought a Richter 6 was a once in a thousand year occurrence, and it happened after 30 years. So the, the, the issue of uh, can we have an East Coast earthquake that's worse than recorded history, sure. Recorded history, the, the worst East Coast earthquake is uh, Cape Ann, right off of Boston. And it happened in 1730 and uh, totally leveled the city. Um, and um, so we do have East Coast earthquakes that um, our plants on the East Coast are, un, are, are not designed to withstand. In today's economy, all of you have heard the questions and discussions about fracking for gas. A lot of companies, a lot of the fracking companies are saying, well, we can frack near nuclear power plants. Uh, that's land that's available. But we want you to know that the fracking causes seismic activity. It causes earthquakes. And those earthquakes then would impact nuclear structures if they frack for gas near a nuclear plant. So let me sum it up. Um, it's easy for the, to the nuclear industry to allow arrogance and hubris to set in when you look at the sheer size of a nuclear plant. I mean, when I was uh, on the panel, the oversight panel, uh, Entergy would bring in farmers and, and, and people in the community and they'd look at this plant and they'd look at how robust it is compared to their barn. Well, the, the, the question that nobody asked is why does it have to be this robust? What is the beast that we're holding back that, um, uh, that requires a building of this robustness? And I think Daiichi's shown us that um, for, firsthand that the safety systems can fail catastrophically. And you know these plants must contain that radioactivity seven days a week, 24 hours every day, 365 days a year. So that, uh, uh, but we know historically there's been at least five that haven't in the last 35 years. One operator mistake, one significant weather event, one seismic event, or worse yet, one terrorist event. And all of New England will have that very bad day. And like Fukushima Daiichi, it will be a very sad future after that very bad day.